Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I'm so happy to be sitting here with, with Richard Russo talking about his new book, Everybody's Fool, which will be available for sale and signing afterwards. Um, you're probably wondering how I am so lucky as to be sitting up here with, with this man. And so I'll briefly tell you. Um, largely because I think it, it kind of speaks to what a generous person he is. So I won't go through the many, many years when I couldn't get anyone to look at my own writing. Um, I'll kind of jump into the point when things changed several years ago. And one of the things that happened was that one day, as I was sitting in my adjunct carol with a bunch of other adjuncts, quietly, all of us writing papers, an email popped up saying that one of my short stories had been chosen for the best American by Richard Russo. And so I, um, in my own head, triumphantly and loudly screamed. And then I went back to writing papers. <laughs> and Fast forward several years, um, my book had, had just been picked up by Scribner, and my editor wrote to me and she said, make your wish list, who are the writers that you would like to read this book, and present a blurb for the back. So I made my list, and at the very top, I put Richard Russo. And I sent her the list, and then I wrote a letter to Richard Russo, and had no idea what would come of it. And around that time, I picked up his memoir, Every, Everywhere, elsewhere. elsewhere. Thank you. I heard somebody whispering frantically <laughs> to me, elsewhere, <laughs> thank you. And so I, th I also trust you about it. <laughs> and so I picked up elsewhere, and I read this section in which he talks about how he, he can't bear to throw away any of the galleys that come his way. And he has hundreds of them, but he simply doesn't have time to read and blurb them all. And so I thought, okay. And then I received this, this note from my agent saying that he had, was reading the book and had agreed to blurb it. And shortly after that, he wrote to my agent again and said, in fact, um, I would like to invite her to Maine, where he lives, to Portland, Maine, to do an interview um, as part of a series that the Writers Guild is doing, matching up well-known writers with those who are trying to emerge. Um, and so I was so pleased when the Bay Area Book Festival wrote, because now the tables are turned. And, <laughs> I am here with, with Richard Russo to talk to him about his new book. I'm guessing that there are probably a lot of um, Nobody's Fool fans in the audience. Yeah, I thought as much. Um, and so this is the sequel. In terms of the time frame, it's about 10 or 11 years later, so it's what, mid 80s, and now we're going to mid 90s. Yep. Um, but in terms of the actual time that it took for the sequel to appear, I think it's something closer to 23 years. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Rick to read from it, but before we get to that, I was just hoping that he could maybe tell us a little bit, because in those 23 years, I think we've seen something like the publication of seven other books, most of them novels, um, Empire Falls, which won a Pulitzer. And The Horse Child, a short story collection. Okay. And his horse memoir. Horse is the word, not horse. <laughs> <laughs> the just, horse. Just for those of you. <laughs> yes, the horse. I'm sorry, was it's I really, saying it like a Midwest? It's, a hard, it's a hard word to say with a microphone. Yeah, and in the Midwest where I'm from, we, yeah. you know, we go with horse. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the memoir elsewhere. And so I was just curious about it, whether the idea for this sequel was something that immediately 
was something you always knew you wanted to do and it was just kind of percolating these 23 years or whether the decision came about quite suddenly, you sat down and started writing it or whether it was, I'm guessing that over the years, every time you read somewhere, people say, I want to know what happened to Sully or you mm -hmm. know, what is Rob doing now? Or, mm -hmm. So what it, exactly, how did it come to be? Um, I, I, I would love to answer that question in Will just a moment, but I have to say bef before launching off into that, one of the one of the things that always it's it's always odd to look at at really good writers um, after their names are made you know their reputations are made and you and you look and then you hear them tell a story like Lori just told about a time when when uh, no one wanted no one wanted to read her work after the fact that always just seems astonishing to me that there was ever a time uh, when a writer like Laurie Oslin, you know, didn't make, didn't make the hair on the back of editor's neck stand up. So, um, uh, it, I mean, it was absolutely clear to me. I was reading for Best American Short Stories that year, and um, Heidi Pittler, who's the series editor for that, sent me the, uh, uh, gosh, what was it, a hundred and some stories, and then because I just like to, I got off the reservation and read another 150 or so before 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 selecting. And um, the story of Lori's that I selected um, just just jumped right out. I mean, there were some stories, you know, when you when you're reading a couple hundred stories and you have to select 20, um, as you can imagine, um, you know, some some will be on the list and and then they'll be off the list, and it's easy to get down to 50. From 50 to 20 is a perfect bitch, uh, and and um, and so some stories would rotate on, they'd rotate off, and and everything. Um, although I had not read anything of of, of Laurie's before, Laurie's story just was on the list and never never went off. So um, okay, but every, everybody's fool. Um, why in the world do something like that? Um, um, the book is dedicated. Uh, to a writer friend of mine, Howard Frank Mosier, um, and I blame him uh, for for this book, because um, we've we've had a and Howard Howard interestingly enough blurbed my first book, and we have been friends for years. Um, he's a wonderful writer. If you don't know his work, uh, well, that's your assignment for tonight: um, is to get on Amazon. Don't buy on Amazon, but get on Amazon <laughs> and, and 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 look it up. Um, um, look, look up Howard Frank Mosier. A good place to begin would be Strangers in the Kingdom, Stranger in the Kingdom, but really you can start anywhere. He's a wonderful storyteller, and he writes about northern Vermont near the, near the Canadian border. Uh, we're both living in New England now. Our paths cross quite a bit. Um, and um, we've gotten in the habit over the years of sending each other um, the crime log from our, from our local newspapers. <laughs> And Howard, Howard and I have um, almost identical uh, senses of humor. We both, we, we, we both love the ridiculous. And the police log is, is of course, the place where you go, really. <laughs> it's, it's the mother load of absurdity. And we've been, we've been, we've been swapping uh, police logs for years, several, several entries of which from, from Howard's uh, uh, North Kingdom Newspaper actually ended up in Everybody's Fool. You don't need to know which ones, but but several several of them did. But anyway, over the years, whenever whenever we would meet, Howard uh, did me the uh, paid me the uh, the wonderful compliment of doing exactly what you talked about, Lori. He would he would say, um, uh, you know, what's going on with Sully and Rub? And he always asked the question as if Sully and Rub were real. Um, and if I had, as if I had probably Skyped with them or talked with them on the telephone <laughs> during, the, during the last couple of weeks. And so over the years, I was becoming a, 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 you know, a greater and greater source of disappointment to Howard because, because I, 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 just, I couldn't reward him the way I wanted to with actual news uh, from, from Sully and Rub. Until, until... Um, one day, my wife and I were somewhere, I don't remember where, uh, and um, someone told this wonderful story about a guy um, who had promised his wife he was going to prune 
a limb from the tree outside um, her bedroom window. When the wind blew, the branch would scrape the window, uh, her, her bedroom window. They didn't sleep in the same bedroom anymore, but that's, that's another story entirely. We don't, we don't have to concern ourselves with that. But, but, um, and so he had promised to do this. He'd been promising to do it for a long time, and someone was supposed to come over and help him, and whoever it was didn't show up. And so he went down into the basement and got his, um, um, what am I, um, chain, yeah, he got his, got his chainsaw. Um, and this is where it gets interesting. The chainsaw is already interesting, but then, but, <laughs> But, but then a, a length of rope. Um, and he tied one end of the length of rope to the chainsaw and another, the other end of the rope to his belt <laughs> and proceeded to climb up, climb up into the tree, which he did. He, got, he gets about 30 feet up um, opposite his wife's bedroom window. She's off at work. Um, and and, he, and he, he sits on the limb that he's going to prune And hauls up the chainsaw. He's sitting now. You have to picture this right, because even he's not stupid enough to sit on the limb that he's going to prune. But I mean, you have to sit. He sits with his back to the trunk of the tree, right? So he sits there with his back to the trunk of the tree, and you have to kind of picture this, because especially if you're a man, you have to kind of picture this, because then you you haul up the chainsaw, you fire it up, you're sitting on the limb that you're about to prune. I just kind of imagine you're going to spread your legs as as, as far apart as you can. <laughs> And he, and he severs the limb. The limb goes tumbling down to the ground. Um, he turns off the chainsaw, lowers it back to the ground. The chainsaw is now on the ground. And he, and he of course, undoes the, 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 the rope that's been tied to, to, his, to his belt. And only then, only then considers his predicament. Because <laughs> there's nothing up here. And there's nothing you can do, of course, with, with the tree trunk behind you. And in order to rotate on what is now a stub, you would need the limb that's now on the ground. So, so, in, order, so in order to do this, now he's in, there he is sitting there uh, with that, and, and there's no way to kind of swing your leg over or, or do anything. You really have nothing to do except um, wait for your wife to come home, <laughs> which... which happened uh, in the fullness of time about five hours later, and you can imagine what sitting on a hard stub of a, of a, of a, of a branch would, would feel like after like five hours uh, of sitting on that stub, and, and feeling not real great, actually, in other respects as well, um, knowing that, you're, that the humiliation you're, you're feeling right now is going to intensify so much <laughs> when, when the woman you're hoping will come home now finally does arrive. So anyway... Um, somebody told me this story, and I thought, oh my God, who would do something like that? And rub squeers came to mind. <laughs> and in place, and in place of the wife, I of course, I of course substituted Sully, who would, who would discover him and make poor Rub's misery um, exponentially greater over the over the course of. Uh, so that's, and and you know, the the funny part of it was, it's just a great story. It's a funny story to tell, and I told it to Howard as if I had just spoken with Rob or Sully on the phone. And I, discovered, and I discovered in the telling something that kind of surprised me, which was that um, telling it as a Rub sully story um, just let me back into that world in a way that I wouldn't have predicted. Um, when you finish a novel, at least when I finish a novel, I feel like, I don't want to say I'm done with these characters, but, but what I've done is resolve their conflicts in some way. And I move on to somebody else, another group of characters who need my help. These characters don't anymore. And because they don't, I, I, I generally don't think an awful lot about them. I'd like to think that my readers think about them after, I've, you know, after the book comes out more than I do. But the ease with which I was let back into North Bath um, and the ease with which um, I, 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 it just felt like a homecoming telling this story. And I recognized in, in telling it, too, that it had the other salutary effect of um, resurrecting my own father, because I've never made any bones of the fact that Sully was based on my own old man. And, um, and, and, in, and after all these years, you know, after, 20, after 23 years, my, my father had died before Nobody's Fool was published. 
So um, I'd been that long without him and missing his company enormously during, during that time. He's a wonderfully entertaining man. And, um, um, and, and discovered that in telling that story, and I thought, well, what if I did write a sequel? And I dabbled a little bit in it and, and discovered that it was like, you know, just kind of, I want to say bringing him back to life, but I discovered that, that if I were going to write one of my novels, which normally takes five or six years, that it would be like having his company again for, for that period of time. And, you know, what better than, what better than that? Well, I'm going to, to ask Rick to, to take us back to North Bath now and to read for a bit from the new novel, from Everybody's Fool. Um, the only thing I have to tell you in the reading, because you won't, if, if you haven't read the earlier book or this one, you won't, there's a, there's a, um, there's a banner, and one of the slogans written across the banner that refers to here um, are things are looking, um, and there, in place of the word up, there's an arrow, right? So, I, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to have to indicate that when it comes to that, that, uh, that symbol on the page. A banner was strung across Main Street for the Memorial Day weekend. The new bath, it said, partnering for tomorrow. This was the brainstorm of Gus Moynihan the town's new mayor, who had been swept into power the previous year on a tidal wave of born-again optimism, more than a decade after, after the demise of the Ultimate Escape Fun Park. An economic catastrophe that had ushered in a golden age of self-loathing and, and fiscal pessimism deeply rooted in two centuries worth of invidious comparison with Schuyler Springs, its better-looking twin and age-old rival. Schuyler had long possessed everything to which Bath aspired. A vibrant local economy, an educated citizenry, visionary leadership, throngs of, of seasonal downstate visitors, and NPR affiliate radio station. <laughs> okay, sure, there'd been some shitty luck involved. Bath's mineral springs had mysteriously dried up over a century ago, while Schuyler's continued to percolate up enthusiastically from its shale. Schuyler also had a famous thoroughbred racetrack, an acclaimed writer's retreat, and a center for the performing arts, a high-toned liberal arts college. Bath had only a beleaguered two-year community college. As well as, a half, as well as a dozen fancy restaurants that served exotic foods like ramps, whatever they were. <laughs> On the restaurant front, all, both, all Bass could both was its rundown roadhouse tavern, the White Horse, Hattie's Lunch, a donut shop, and the old Applebee's out by the freeway exit. What all this amounted to, everyone agreed, was a complete economic and cultural rout. For a while, the fun park had gotten people's hopes up. But when they were dashed, but, but when they were dashed, the collective despair was so profound that the town had even stopped stringing the buoyant, optimistic Main Street banners that had become its dubious, stra dubious trademark, the last of which had read, things are looking <laughs> in Bath. The gloom had lasted until Gus Moynihan, a retired, a retired college professor who was renovating one of the grand old Victorians on Upper Main Street, wrote a guest newspaper editorial decrying the town's mordant defeatism and criticizing the current Republican administration's unspoken policies, which could be summed up, he claimed, in nine words. No spending, none, ever, on anything under any circumstances. <laughs> Why not string one last banner across the street, he suggested. It would read, let's eat dirt. <laughs> the editorial had struck a chord and made a mayoral candidate of its author. Even his opponents had to admit that Gus and his cronies, many of them from away, had run a clever campaign 
Let's be Schuyler Springs, was the gist of it. Instead of competing with their obnoxious neighbor, why not take advantage of its proximity? Half of the people who came to the racetrack and performing arts center in the summer had no place to stay and ended up in hotels as far away as Schenectady. Why shouldn't they stay in Bath? Okay, the old Sans Souci Hotel and Resort with its nearly 300 rooms had run into legal difficulties, fueled by local resentment when it, came, when it became known that the new owners would be using downstate contractors and labor for almost everything. The old hotel's lavish renovations had cost far more and taken much longer than expected, causing it to miss much of the summer tourist trade that first season. And the locals had steadfastly rebelled against, the, against its prices, against the prices in its fancy restaurant. But that didn't mean the whole concept was flawed, or so the Moynihan crowd had argued. Instead of throwing up roadblocks to entrepreneurship, the town should have offered tax breaks and other incentives. Same deal with restaurants. During the short summer season, desperate, hungry travelers even mobbed the horse. So why not entice a young chef or two up from New York City? Find out what the hell ramps were and serve them. <laughs> if that's what people really craved, it wasn't like Schuyler Springs had cornered the, cornered the world ramps market and refused to share. Overnight, the new byword was partnering. Whenever possible, Bath would partner not only with odious Schuyler Springs and moneyed downstaters, but also with local entrepreneurs in projects of exceptional merit. One of these was Carl Roebuck, who most people were surprised to learn was an entrepreneur, having known him all their lives as a con man and an asshole. <laughs> Thank you, Red. <laughs> well, let's stick with, with Bath for a moment um, because it's such an intriguing place. And, and I think it's at the end of Nobody's Fool or near the end that we find out that the fun park never comes about because um, the developers realize that they would have to employ the people of Bath to work right. there. And they took a look around Bath and thought, we can't have these people <laughs> welcoming our visitors. We hope to succeed. So I was, I was um, reading the New York Times review, Janet Maslin's review, mm -hmm. and she talks about Bath as a town where dishonesty abounds, everyone misapprehends everyone else, and half the citizens are half crazy. It's a great place for a reader to visit, and it seems to be Mr. Russo's spiritual home. <laughs> <laughs> and so my question, of course, is... You've just defined backhanded compliment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you consider it your spiritual home? And Well, it must be. I keep going back there, don't I? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fair, I think that's a fair that's assessment. A, that's a fair assessment. But, so, kind of maybe to, to follow up with, with the first question a little bit and bring it in line with this one. I was reading an article last week about um, this big uproar. I don't read comic books, mm -hmm. but Captain America, is a Captain America was um, after years as this good guy his, the, the comic book writer announced that he was really a double agent or something like this. Mm -hmm. And it's apparently created an uproar and resulted in death threats and the writer has been hearing all sorts of things. So I'm curious to know over the years what it is that when people talk to you about Nobody's Fool, what they wanted to know. And now as you kind of go around on your tour, if you've answered their questions, what it is, or what it is that people bemoan, oh, we don't, know this yet, but, but what is kind of the feedback about this town that makes readers so interested in knowing about it? It's a lovely question, and I wish I knew the answer to it. Um, I, I think that when I, 
When I first started writing these books, and it, and it wasn't immediately clear to me, even after Mohawk and the Risk Pool, two, two novels set in, in towns like the ones that I've become known for writing about, it wasn't immediately clear to me at that time that I was going to be a writer of small towns like this, of upstate New York mill towns. I imagined my career might just kind of, I don't know, um, go off into the, you know, into the ether somewhere that I might be writing about very, very different things. If somebody had told me then that um, this would become, <laughs> that, that these various versions of the town that I grew up in, Gloversville, New York, would become my spiritual home, um, I think I would have been very surprised to learn it. Um, and I would have been even more surprised to learn that there would have been anything like an appetite for it among folks like yourselves. Um, when I first started writing and first started going on book tours and talking with people, I was very surprised to discover, in fact, who my readers really were. At the beginning, I thought that that I would be, that my readers would be rather like the, like the people I was writing about. Um, I thought, especially based on my first two novels, which are father-son stories and really centered on male misbehavior, that my, that my readers would be mostly male. Um, I thought that they would be mostly blue collar. Um, because that's what I was writing about, the kind of, hard, kind of hard physical labor that my own father did and that I did for a few years when I joined him uh, in, 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 uh, you know, in the summers uh, when I was home from college. It was probably around the time that I wrote Nobody's Fool, Laurie, that I began to realize that I was completely wrong about my readership. They were, in fact, well, if it's fiction, almost everybody, all, most of almost everybody's readers will be women, regardless of what you're writing about, because the vast majority of readers of fiction in this country for a very long time have been women, and that when, despite my subject matter, that was certainly true of, of my readership. Um, they were also largely urban, not small town, and they were largely educated, which I wouldn't have predicted either, um, although I never condescend, or I like to think I never condescend to my characters, it just didn't dawn on me that this was who my readership was. But that's just a kind of demographic sketch, isn't it? Um, and as I've been on tour after tour, um, uh, it's become clear to me that a lot of my readers, despite the fact that they, that they, that they are disproportionately women, and, are, and, have, um, and have a good deal of education and are much more likely to live in cities than small towns, very often if you scratch a little bit beneath the surface, you discover that there is um, some small town either in their memory or in their, their parents' memory, some small town that they visit where their grandparents maybe still live. Um, and, and maybe most of my readers are women, but there is some rogue male in their, in their lives, not unlike Sully or Max Roby. Um, and they may live in cities, and they may love the cities that they live in, but most Americans who have drifted to cities and love them and continue to live in them find themselves missing something. Um, and it's that something that I think your question is really, is really about. What, what is that something about towns like North Bath and Thomaston and Mohawk that I, have, that I have been writing about? It seems to me that it has something to do with family. Um, as we've all, you know, as, as Americans have I mean, everybody from every, I, I see people from Gloversville everywhere I go. Um, uh, even, hi, how are you? <laughs> I see people from, from Gloversville everywhere I go. Um, um, south, north, east, west. 
Well, they had to go somewhere. They couldn't stay there. There was no opportunity there. And, and I think that that's true of a lot of American small towns. People, people had to end up somewhere, but that means that they grew up. Um, they very likely grew up in a town like Gloversville or like my Mohawk or, or, or Thomaston, and something about life there, whether it was its, its simplicity or the, or the nearness of relatives or um, the fact that you could know everybody there, I think it has something to do with it. Um, part of the reasons that, that I continue to write about these towns, I think, is that I'm just so interested in class. And if you are interested in class, what better than a small town, a place like Empire Falls, where the richest woman in town who owns almost everything and everybody has to cross paths on an almost daily basis with characters like John Voss, who is going to, who's going to do that, that dreadful school shooting towards, towards the end of that novel. And I think that as we've moved, as we've moved um, to more complex um, lives in, in different places, um, I, I think we're, the, the very complexity makes us feel sometimes like we don't understand all the threads of our own lives. I mean, we continue to, we continue to move about in them and, and we try to do so with, with a kind, the kind of competence that suggests that, competence that suggests that we know what we're doing. Um, but there's something, there's something about North Bath. It's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a chamber of commerce portrait of a town, certainly. But these people know each other. Um, they, they know each other, and at the same time, their lives are deeply mysterious. But we, somehow or other, it just seems to me that we can kind of wrap our minds, our minds and our hearts and our souls around something um, that, that somehow or other we, we may feel has become lost to us. It's something we're, it's something we're after. It's not a very good answer, but it's, it's the best I can do. <laughs> I actually thought it was a great answer. I was just thinking in my head, that's a great answer. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to it. Um, as Rick kno knows, I, I grew up in a town of 400 people, and I grew up in my parents' hardware store. And so the people of North Bath, even though it's a much different part of the country, are, are very familiar to me. And you see... I liked what you said about not condescending to them because um, I was thinking about so many of these characters and especially these supporting characters I love and the, thing, the moments that make me laugh. And so I just pulled up a, a few of those moments, one from Nobody's Fool. And it's when Ralph, I don't know if everyone remembers, but Ralph is, so Peter, is Sully's son, but he hasn't been that involved in his life up until um, that point. And so Ralph is kind of, he's this affable fellow who's helped to, to raise him. And so Peter is, has come home, he, he didn't get tenure, and he's moved back in with Ralph and his mother. And this woman, his colleague, whom he's been sleeping with, um, calls, and she gets Ralph on the phone. And Ralph says, Peter is not home. And so by way of, of hanging up, she says, when he gets home, just ask him, do I or do I not give the best head on the East Coast? <laughs> so Ralph, poor Ralph, is sitting there wondering who this woman is. <laughs> and so he says to Peter, wherever did you meet her? And Peter admits that he met her at a poetry reading. <laughs> and, 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 and then Rick writes, Ralph shook his head. He'd never been to a poetry reading. The reason he'd never gone to one, the people would be reading poetry there. <laughs> <laughs> had always seemed sufficient. <laughs> but now he had another reason, <laughs> if he ever needed one. And I, it was one of those moments, I was reading Nobody's Fool, rereading Nobody's Fool in preparation for this. Um, I was laughing so hard at that, and I reread it, and then I picked up Everybody's Fool, 
And again, there's this same kind of gentle humor that involves people who know that there would never be a reason to go to a poetry reading. And in this case, it's one of our main characters of Everybody's Fool, Chief Raymer, you re may remember him from, from Nobody's Fool as the, the cop that Sully punched. Um, and now he has become one of the main characters and he's also become the chief of police. And so there's this great moment near the beginning where he talks about going away on his honeymoon and he gets, he and his wife go, and when they arrive, he discovers that she's packed a suitcase full of books. And so he thinks to himself, he wonders, what did she need with so many books? His first horrified thought was that they'd somehow gotten their signals crossed, and she meant for the marriage to be platonic. <laughs> that turned out not to be the case, though after they finished making love, Becca would often sigh contentedly and pick up a book and immediately become engrossed, which made Raymer feel like a short, possibly insignificant chapter. <laughs> and so I absolutely love these, these, these moments, and I know these people. And so this question is probably... God help me, I love them too. <laughs> 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 so this, this, this question's probably not even fair to ask um, because Everybody's Fool is, is set in the mid-90s. But I thought we would just kind of bring it up to date. We're in the middle of the current political season. Mm -hmm. And before you arrived on your tour, Donald Trump was here mm. last mm. a couple of days ago. And so I just started to think about... Um, What's so wonderful about your books is that it, it, these political divisions don't exist. But then I was having a, a beer with my wife the other day and she said, I wonder who some of the people in North Bath would be voting for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this isn't fair, but I'm curious because I'm curious to know, for example, Sully. Mm -hmm. Like if he, if he went to the poll, well, if you went to the poll this, this year, who would he be voting for, do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's um, uh, I don't know if it's an unfair question or not, but you're not the first to ask it. I actually got asked that on NPR and on, on, morning, you did. I on, know morning, on morning Edition. Uh -huh. And I'm glad to answer it again because I botched the answer so badly. <laughs> it, was, it, was the last, it was the last question that Steve Inskeep asked me, and when... I knew how long the interview was going to be, and when, when you know that, you know, when you're talking, and you know, you, and you know that whatever you say is going to go out um, over the, not just local airwaves, you're, you, can, you, you have a, the opportunity here, here to make a national fool of yourself. And what that, what that triggers is a kind of internal clock. Um, if you know that the interview is going to last 25 minutes, it's not like I put my watch out there and was watching it watching it tick along towards 25, but I do have a pretty good internal uh, chronometer, especially when I'm suffering. Uh, <laughs> and so I got to about minute 24, and I'm th thinking to myself, very pleased with myself actually, thinking that I had, um, that on the basis of this interview, there would be yet another stay of execution. Um, and, and he asked me that question. He said, "This, you, you know, you've been writing about this this region of the world, and for a long time, and about blue collar, blue collar folk, um, hardworking blue collar folk. Uh, how would how, how, how do you think your characters would be voting?" Um, and it so took me by surprise, and with only one minute left. Um, to answer, I, I did make a thoroughly botched job of it. First, because I didn't. It, I wasn't clever enough to, to realize that, that it was really kind of a, kind of a two-part question, one of which was kind of sociological, uh, which unfortunately was the one that I, that I answered. Um, and the other part was more, um, the other part was more psychological, um, which, which was the part that I, that I so deeply regret now, you know, three, three weeks later, 
Uh, I'm, I'm still, when I wake up in the middle of the night, as I tend to do on book tour, I wake up in the middle of the night and this is the very thing that I'm thinking about. How I would love to turn back the clock and answer that question again, so here we are. <laughs> I answered the sociological question, which was the easy one, um, which was that um, I said, well, basically that, that we know how the people in upstate New York and, and, and right across the Rust Belt have voted, and, 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 um, the, and the vast majority, certainly on the Republican side, have, have voted for Donald Trump. They've, they've, they've heard his nativist, um, line and they seem to have bought it lock, stock, and tomahawk and, and uh, it just, um, and I said, you know, that it, 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 broke, it broke my heart to think that people like the people that I've devoted my creative life to writing about, that so many of them um, uh, in real life seem to, be, seem to be voting for Donald Trump. The correct answer that I will give now here to you in Berkeley <laughs> and which I will not be able to share with the rest of the nation unless for some reason I should be asked that question again. Um, the, um, the correct answer is that the vast majority of my characters would not have been fooled by a third-rate con man like Donald Trump, even for a second. <laughs> that was... That was, the, that was the question. Uh, that was the question that I should have answered. The question I should have answered was, you know, you, could, you can take the characters in this novel and kind of, uh, and kind of um, look at them and, and individually and say, all right, who, 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 you know, who would and, and who wouldn't? Can, can anyone here who's read, you know, either the early book or this one think for a minute that Miss Burrell, who is the, really the presiding spirit of in some ways of both of these novels, that Miss Burl would have been fooled for a moment by Donald Trump, it's, it's unthinkable. And I think Sully has absorbed too much of Miss Burl's honesty. Um, and she has taught him too well for him to be fooled. And even now officer, now chief of police, Raymer, who, has, who is, in a sense, the title character of this book because he believes himself to be a fool, he too has, as a result of having been Miss Burrell's student, there's a metaphor in this book about what Miss Burrell does is that she, she, writes, she writes in copiously in the margins of her students' papers. Well, that's what good teachers do for all of us. They write in our margins. And long after we're out of their classes, the best of them we're still talking to, we're still remembering. Even if we don't remember their names, we're remembering their lessons. And even though um, Chief of Police Raymer would agree, you know, uh, through the vast majority of this book, that, that, he, that he is, he thinks of himself as a fool because that's what everybody has called him all his life. Um, but, um, he may think of himself as a fool, but he's, he's absorbed far too much of Miss Burrell's fierce intelligence um, to ever be conned, I think, in quite that way. Which is not to say that there aren't a lot of characters in this book who would be Trump voters. Uh, Spin Maddox Joe. Um, <laughs> You'll, you'll get the joke when you, when you get there. You're thinking, what, what the hell is a spinmatic? You, you, trust me, it'll be, it'll, it'll be fine. Spinmatics Joe, we know how he'd vote. We know how Roy Purdy would vote. And we know, too, that there are, that there are, people, that there are people in this book, um, good people, I think, kind people, decent people, who are so god-awful tired of careful, cautious political rhetoric, that any kind of voice that doesn't sound like it is canned and handled um, by, you know, a hundred advisors, anything that comes across as genuine, even if it's genuinely moronic, is, 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 going, to, is going to apply, is, go, is going to, uh, you know, is, is going to sound fresh and uh, and, 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 it, and at the very least, human. So there, I, there's, no, there's no question that there would be 
loads of characters um, um, in my novels who, who would who would listen to a voice that does not sound, sound canned and say, well, and think, well, this is new. This is new, maybe this, maybe this and it's playing to my fears too, so, so maybe, it, maybe I'll listen. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity of clearing that up. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's my pleasure. One of the things that I was thinking about when I was Rereading Nobody's Fool, and then this one in fairly close mm. to, to each other, um, was that in, in, the, in Nobody's Fool, bad things happen, but often it's a character's weakness that leads to these, these bad things. Um, just bad decisions, weakness, these sorts of things. And in the first book, we're introduced to Roy Purdy. Mm -hmm. Roy Purdy is the boyfriend. So you probably remember Ruth is Sully's longtime girlfriend, secret girlfriend that everyone knows about. <laughs> um, and she has a daughter, Janie. And Janie is married to Roy Purdy, and Roy Purdy breaks her jaw and ends up in jail in the first book. Mm -hmm. In the second book, Roy Purdy is out, and he's not, he's, he's not a, a, a nice man. And there's a lot of violence that kind of ensues and that brings everyone else into it without giving too much away. Um, and so the book goes into a little bit of a darker place mm -hmm. than, the, than, the, than Nobody's Fool. And so I was thinking, but at the same time, we have these things that are incredibly funny. We have, you know, the cemetery in which all of the caskets are just kind of floating underground down. There's some line about how the casket that you visit one week might not be the one that you're <laughs> the visiting. Headstone, the headstone will be the same. The, the casket beneath it may have, may have, may have changed yeah. if it's rained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is great. And there's... Um, the, the exotic snakes, and there is Sully's new dog, whose name is also Rub, who has chewed off half of his penis. And so there's all of these very funny things that, that balance this much darker now. And so I was curious to know a little bit about the, the darker tone shift. Were you aware that it was going to go there, or did that kind of surprise you? Did, Roy Purdy just suddenly appear again. Yeah, it, it is a much darker book, I think, and and I and I hope it's every bit as funny because the darker things get, the funnier they should be in order to just you know, uh, that's you know Twain taught taught me that if you if you're gonna if the subject of your book is is going to be violence and and ignorance and bigotry and 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 all of those all of those things, you, it really, you really do well to go armed with humor uh, into, those, uh, into those arenas. And I think that this, that this book is much darker than nobody's, it, it, much darker than nobody's fool. Uh, and, and, and the question is, I, I suppose, inherent uh, in your question, Laurie, is why? why? Why would this book that has so many of the same characters um, and it takes place in the same place, and really, it's only ten years later, despite the fact that I it, it, that I wrote it twenty three years after the fact. So why? I mean, we it's almost like we we have a controlled experiment here. We have the same place, many of the same people. Only ten years have elapsed. Why in the world would this book be so much darker than the early one? And I think that it has less to do with this place and these people than it, than it does um, its author and what's happened to me over the last 23 years. And I, don't, and I, I know I have to immediately clarify that by saying that the last 23 years of my life have been, I mean, I have every reason personally to be the world's greatest optimist. I am, I am, I sit before you a poster boy of good fortune. Um, I, unlike so many of my writing, my writer friends, 
Um, I, I, I made my name and my reputation back when a time when there were many more opportunities in publishing than there are for emerging writers now. It's one of the reasons I'm so devoted to, to um, uh, offering what, what help I can to those who are emerging now in a much tougher universe after the, after the digital revolution. So no, I have been very, very fortunate. Um, my health is good. Uh, I've been married to the same woman for 43 years, who is, who is well, I, I just can't even begin to tell you. Um, I have two daughters who are healthy. I have grandchildren. Um, everything on the good ship Russo is uh, uh, just, I, I, I wouldn't change a thing, but as a nation, uh, as a nation, we've all been through a lot. Um, we've all been through 9-11. We've, we've, you know, we don't even, we've already talked about the current political situation. Um, and um, I, I think that, um, I think that as a result of the last, the last, let, let me put it this way, the last 23 years, if, you, if I take myself out of the equation and I look at my nation, um, the last 23 years have strained my optimism. And this book, um, this book is different from Nobody's Fool because Nobody's Fool contained so much, not only of my own optimism, but Sully and Ruth and Miss Burl and all of the main characters of that <coughs> other book still had in their minds a kind of post-war optimism. Sully, like my own father, uh, was a D-Day guy. Um, and that generation of men and, and, the, and the women who worked their jobs while they were overseas fighting, Americans came, after that was over, they had a sense of a new, better, more just America. And not just, not just even in places like Gloversville and Bath, and, um, and Thomaston, but especially in those places, especially in those places. I remember my parents thinking that this was going to be a less class-oriented society. People, people, regardless of race, creed, or color, were going to have better opportunities. That this, this incredible thing that Americans had all done together, winning the war that simply had to be won, if we could do that, what, 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 would be, what would we be unequal to? And even in places like Thomaston and Empire Falls and, and, and North Bath, there, there, there was, a, there was a, that sense that evil had been decisively dealt with. Um, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if we could believe that now? Wouldn't it be? But in fact, um, what, so when I say the last, the last 23 years have, have um, you know, despite my own great personal good fortune, um, I, I, I look at our nation like I'm sure many of you do too. Um, look at the nation that we are now and what we're afraid of and what we're willing to surrender. Um, and, and we've seen the limits of American power. Um, we, and, 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 we have, and we have stared at some pretty astonishing evil that we, it's, it's all we can call it. It's all that it is. Um, and so this book gets written, I think, with all of that, maybe not in the front of my brain, but certainly in the back of my brain. How do you not, how do you not, how do you not, if you're going to write honestly, um, how, how do you simply ignore those those things? So so evil so evil in this but in this book in the in the form of of Roy Purdy, um, but also in the form of of Kurt um, Alice's Alice's husband uh, in this book. And just I mean we have snakes in this book. You've never had a you've never had a serpent in a Richard Russo novel before. And you can't and and you can't you can't you can't go to snakes. You just can't go there without without returning. You know, to the garden, can we? That's that's our symbol. That's our symbol um, for uh, for for evil. And there it was, kind of kind of ready made for me. 
Um, so I think it's I think the difference between the earlier book and 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 this one is um, uh, you know is is found in, in its author, but also found in 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 all of us as as Americans as we as we you know try to try to recapture. I think because we all want that again. We want that sense of of an America that is is uh, um, what it what it should be. We don't all define that in exactly the same way, of course, but. Along those lines, I was mm -hmm. thinking about a, a, a sentence in the book that so struck me when I got to it. And it comes during a moment when Sully is remembering the whole scene from Nobody's Fool, where he takes Peter, his son, who has been denied tenure, and takes him out to steal back the snowblower, which is one of my favorite scenes. And this involves Peter having, to, they, they um, give the, the dog a tranquilizer, and then Peter has to climb over this fence, and they are victorious, and they go back to the horse, and they're having a beer, and in Everybody's Fool, Sully's thinking about this, and he remembers how happy Peter had been afterward, and he thinks maybe Peter had finally given himself permission to enjoy life from a less ironic distance. Um, and it struck me so much, and I thought about it also when you were answering your question about why the book, why these book, North Bath mm -hmm. and these characters appeal to people. Um, but it also got me thinking because of, of course, Peter is a professor, he's spent his life in academia and I, caught tones of that also. Um, mm -hmm. And it got me to thinking also about straight man, which mm -hmm. is probably um, most of my friends who are in academia, that's their favorite mm -hmm. Richard Russo <laughs> book. Um, and I always enjoy these moments when academia, and I know you spent your career in, in academia, mm -hmm. um, but I always enjoy these moments. And so my question, though, is, is really more about what's next. Because one of the joys of Facebook is that I can go on Facebook and a Facebook friend I've never met will say, guess who was just here giving a reading, Richard Russo, and it was amazing, and the hour flew by. And the question that came up was, could there be a sequel of Empire Falls? And the answer was, if there is another sequel, it might be straight man. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's more to say about academia? Um, you know, honestly, Lori, I don't know. If, if the general question is what's next. Mm -hmm. That is the general yeah, question. Yeah, if the general question is, is, is what's next, um, then I, 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 if there is a sequel to Straight Man, I don't think it would come next. Okay. Um, I, it, writing this book and, and discovering that these characters welcomed, welcomed me back into their lives has, has just been so thrilling that, that the idea of writing a sequel at some point um, to another book of mine, especially that, you know, um, and Straight Man, of all of my books, Straight Man was the easiest to write. It was just a gas. I, I, it didn't, um, it caused, some of, some of these books have caused rectal bleeding. That was... <laughs> That was just, that was just, if I could get another, if I would write another version of Straight Man, just if they guaranteed me that it would be as easy as the first one, because that was, that was just a joy start to finish. And, and uh, so if I could get another book that was just that much, <laughs> that much fun and that easy, why, why, why wouldn't I do that? Um, so I'll, I'll never say never. Um, but you know what? Um, you get, I'm 66 now and I start factoring these things out, they take me five or six years for the most part. Anymore, it takes me twice as, it seems to take me twice as long to do half as much. Um, and so um, you, 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 begin, you begin to think, all right, how many more years do I have? Fortunately, my, my health is still good as far as I know. There might be something I don't know about, but as far as I know, my health is still good. 
I still have, um, I still take great, I take enormous joy. And to go back, Lori, to just a, a, a moment for, to something you said earlier about these, these small moments of, you know, rub the dog's penis and, and you know, there's there several of the moments that, that, that you mentioned that are just, they are just so, to me, they are so full of joy. Um, I, I know, I know. Why should, why should, watch, watching, a do, why should watching a dog chew his own dick off be, be, be joyous? But, but it is. And, <laughs> um, so, and, and so the, the idea, I can't imagine myself not writing. And I, and, I, and I want to continue in some ways. I mean, I would string these moments together, even if they didn't amount to a coherent novel, just because there's just so much fun on their own, and I'm having such a good time, and, and I've, I've come to trust over the years that if I'm, having, if I'm having fun, at least some of you will be too. So I, I, want, I really want to continue to do this um, for as long as I'm any good at it. Um, but I'm also aware at, at, at 66, you don't look at your career at 66 the way you do at 36 or 46 or even 56. I, 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 the, the years are simply not infinite, um, and your time, on this, your time in this place is not uh, infinite. And so um, I, have, I have an idea in the back of my mind right now. It's, it's, it's a little bent thing back there. Um, and it strikes me as, despite the fact that I know nothing about it, except maybe just one or two little slivers of something slightly skewed that might be a new book. And if I can get to work on it this fall, factor that forward, by the time it comes out, I'm 71, jeez. And I want to be like Philip Roth. Um, I want to be like Philip Roth before he, decide, before, he, before he decided not to do it anymore. I want, I want, I want to have that same, I want to have that same enthusiasm, um, and, I, and I, I want to be like, like Roth was before he made his big announcement, someone who just continues, who, who refuses to think of himself as an old man and, and, and thinks of himself as, as, as someone um, who's going to continue doing forever what he, what he does well. And that's what, and, and that's kind of the way I'm thinking about the future. Um, I, I, I think there's this, there's this other book. Um, I'm just, I just d delivered a, a collection of short stories to my editor, and I'm one essay shy of a collection of essays. This other book. Uh, so, we're, we're, but we're, we're talking, we're talking. If there's a sequel to anything else I've ever written, you know, we're, we're, we're getting, we're getting out there <laughs> in terms of chron chronologically. Um, but that's the, great, that's, that's the great joy and the great blessing of the career that I've had so far is that I've been able to do it. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, God, what would I have done, what would I have done otherwise? I, I asked Robert Benton that. Robert Benton directed the, the movie of, of, uh, of Nobody's Fool. And we had, a, we had an, an evening once where I was interviewing um, uh, Mr. Benton the way, you know, the way Lori is interviewing me now and the way I interviewed her earlier this, earlier this year. And uh, I, asked, I asked Benton um, that if he hadn't become a filmmaker, what would he have done? And, what I was, and, and, and he, he seemed a little bit stumped by the question. And I, and I, and I went on to say, you know, I think, because I, I, knowing you as I do, if you weren't a filmmaker, I just cannot imagine you going through life not making something. Surely you're, you're you know, at the, at, the, at, the, at the root of who you are is there's this desire to create, to 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 make things and he just kind of smiled and he said like like duck decoys <laughs> <laughs> so but it is i mean the, the great the great joy of his life is i mean he he discovered that he discovered he discovered he was um mildly dyslexic as a child he had trouble with words but my god was he was he good with images and and um and he, and he found the he found that thing that would allow him to tell the stories that he that he wanted to tell and i one of the reasons that i feel most blessed is that that um, i came to it late but um um found it found this this thing that has given my life a shape and structure 
That is perfect timing. <laughs> so I wanted to leave about 15 minutes for, for all of you to ask questions of Rick. And we have a microphone. Excellent. Um, hi. So hi. Um, I was very interested when you said that you are uh, specifically interested in the topic of class mm -hmm. and, and also portraying a small town. And, and I was wondering um, uh, who are the novelists or, or writers um, or works of fiction that you have inspired you in, in writing about small towns? And also, have you considered, uh, you know, more of an urban space where also, like San Francisco, you know, we're close by, um, where we have a big inequality. They, we have mm -hmm. 22 billionaires and we have 6,000 homeless people. So right. uh, have you thought about writing about uh, such towns as well? Well, the first part of your, first part of your question, um, 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 influences on me. I, I think they'd be fairly, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that, that I was influenced by Winesburg, Ohio, for instance, um, um, and, 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 and um, other small town books. But I, you know, I honestly, in terms of my reading, I, I'm such an eclectic reader. I, I don't feel like, I don't feel like the, just because I'm, I'm interested in class and writing about small towns, I, that's, it's not that I read any more about that than I read about anything else, because I'm, I'm interested in all sorts of, all sorts of different worlds. Um, and I particularly, I particularly like it when an author introduces me to a world that I know absolutely nothing about. I think that's one of the great joys of, one of the great joys of reading. And I, and I also, um, I'm, um, there, are, there are certain things that I am loath to do that may, that may be either, it's, that would be either probably either wisdom or cowardice, depending on how you look at it. Um, I have never written a, a specific, in a specifically urban setting because I think that, um, that writers like Richard Price and Dennis Lehane and, and um, uh, who's the other wonderful crime writer that wrote for The Wire? Um, uh, George Pelicanos. Um, I, I think that, 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 those, that those writers just know that. They know that um, without really even having to think about it. And, I, and I, if, I, if I, I would have to think about it, and even then I wouldn't arrive at the right conclusions. So call it cowardice or, or wisdom or whatever. I have the wisdom to stay out of that or, or, the, or I, I, lack the, I, I lack the courage to try. Um, um, and um, I, I feel like, you know, questions like... Um, like inequality um, in its own, in its microcosmic way. I, th I think I can deal with those things in books like Empire Falls where we have Mrs. Whiting who owns the town and, and, and everybody else um, who, who, you know, is under, is under the sharp heel of her boot. Hello. Hi. You haven't mentioned the actual name of the town that North Bath it is based on. I'm from there. I uh, went to high school and junior high there 50 years ago. And you've really captured... Well, I'm sorry, which, 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 state are you, which state are you in? North Bath, New York. North Bath, New York? The, other t the real name. Really? Yeah. Well, I know there's a Bath, New York. I didn't know no, there was no, a no. North Bath. No, the town you based it on. Oh, oh, okay. You haven't named it, and I don't know why you haven't named it. Boston Spa. Boston Spa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now you, we're on the same page. All yeah. right. Now, now I know what you're... Well, you, you didn't mention yeah. it, so I don't know if I should or not. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. No, really, that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, you really captured, I, from both books, you've captured kind of the feel of Boston Spa. You captured, the, in the first book, the, the class uh, between the north end of town and High Street. Mm -hmm. You've captured that. And the working class people, you captured that. My question is, how did you, I, Gloversville is not too far away, but how did you come to actually pick Boston Spa as the scene for your book? And how much time did you have to spend there to learn the characters? I, the characters seem real to me. Mm -hmm. um, I went to high school with the current mayor, who was the class drunk, mm -hmm. and <laughs> is now clean and sober, uh, mm -hmm. and he's doing a good job as mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think all the liberals moved away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how long did I have to spend there? Uh, I've, I've never been to Boston Spa except to drive through. <laughs> Seriously, I, 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 could just, I can just feel all the air just going right out of your balloon. <laughs> um, you know what? 
I know. Well, I might have. Yeah, I think. I, I think at some point I did. I did. I was in town one afternoon, and I think I was specifically re researching at what point the springs ran dry in Boston Spa, but the and the springs ran dry in some other towns nearby too, where they continued to percolate in the other town that that Schuyler Springs is based on. Of course, is Saratoga. You probably all recognize that. Um, the the reason that I moved up the road. Um, frankly, to, to what you recognize as Boston Spa, I was perfectly happy to, to, um, to write another Mohawk novel, and I would have done so, except that I knew from the beginning that I needed for there to be a lucky town and an unlucky town, and, and, they, needed, and they needed to be neighbors. And um, the, first two, the first two novels had made very clear that there was, luck, there was no luck anywhere nearby. So in order, to get, in order to get to Schuyler Springs, which I needed for this book, I had to locate it someplace that was no more than like five miles away. And as I started looking around in that, you know, looking at the map, looking around where would that be, then there was, and, and Boston Spa came, came to mind. And I looked up just a couple things about it, but I never spent, I never spent any time there at all. My aunt lives there now. Uh, my, my mother's sister lives there, but did not, but did not at the time. But you know, my, my feeling about this is, because people have, have described me as a, as a writer of place, uh, and my feeling always is that if you get the class details right, people will make the necessary mental adjustment to, to think of it, to think of, think of it as their, as, as their place. And I'm so delighted that that's, that that's what you did. You thought, I'd, you, 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 you thought I had been there or spent time there, and, and I hadn't. Um, People, but I mean, one of the things that I was very surprised by uh, in, concerning Empire Falls is that that book is set in Maine. Uh, and the only reason that I set it in Maine was that I needed, it, for that book, I needed for there to be a nearby coast because I wanted, uh, I wanted Miles' father, Max, to disappear for the entire summer by painting rich people's windows shut. That was, I just had that detail. In, in my mind. And if it was an upstate New York novel, he just would have had to have driven too far. Max would have never, he needed to be within 30 miles of the coast. So I sent it, so I set it in Maine, but I was very worried because Mainers were, and I had only lived there for a few years before I, before I wrote Empire Falls, Mainers are absolutely territorial. Um, and if you want to write about the state of Maine, do so, but do, but do so with the understanding that if you're from away, you better get things right. And um, so I was fully expecting a, a huge virulent backlash um, from, from my neighbors because I had seen it happen to other writers who had set stories and, and novels there. And in fact, the book was just, was just embraced by Maine in a way that I, I simply could not I, I couldn't fathom, I, and I was not expecting it. And I think, again, it was that I, that I got these people's work lives right. I got the, the, the way they lived their lives, the amount of money that they had, how hard they had to work. Um, that was all recognizable to them. But those are all class, those are all class details, I think. I think we have time for, for one more question. Having described yourself, oh, is it on? Having described yourself as an author of place, I just wondered. I heard some of the spirit, the absurdity, the humor of Isaac Bashevis Singer's Helm. Are you familiar with with that place? No, I'm not. No. Ah. I do have a lovely singer story, though, if you'd like to hear it. Um, in in very, very old age, he came to where I was teaching in Southern, uh, Southern Illinois University. Um, and he was in pretty ill health. Um, and, his, and his wife was with him. His wife was kind of acting as a keeper, as his keeper. He was, he was very old and very frail. And um, for the reading, and boy, they, we worked him there. This is a man deep in his 90s, and we worked him that day like a rented mule. I mean, he went from class to class to class, 
And, we, we, and, and then that night after we're at dinner, a faculty dinner and all of that, and he had to give, um, he had to give um, a talk, and, or he had to give a reading from one of his books. And when he came out, you could, f you could hear in the audience a kind of collective sigh, because what he, when he came out, he had a sheaf of papers that was like that thick, you know? And he said, oh, I'm going to read. And they were, they, were in, they were stapled with some sort of industrial strength <laughs> stapler. And his idea had been, when he got to the podium, that he, would, that he would turn each page. But of course, when he got up there, um, when he got up there, and he couldn't fold it under, it was just cumbersome. And so he thought, all right, so he said what he was going to do was when he finished a page, he would just tear it off. <laughs> You know, and just and just drop it, you know, but the the air currents were such <laughs> in the in the place. Uh, and when he began to read, we realized that, that the reason that he was really he was going to read every single word on all of those pages, but there were like only ten words on each page because they had to be printed so large that he could see them. This is a man that's deep. He's deep in his nineties, and um, and so. When he got to the end, when he got to the end of the, each page, he would tear it off. And, and the mics were much more alive than this, and of course there was a podium, so, and he was very feeble. So when he got to the end of the page and went to tear it off, you'd, there'd be a struggle. And, 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 and he would pull on the page and it would finally pop loose and it would be like a gunshot when it, when it, when it, popped, when it popped off. And, he, and, it went, and when he dropped, and when he dropped the, um, and the, the stage was much higher than this stage, and so when he dropped each sheet, it went <laughs> off into the audience, and people were, stand <laughs> people were standing to, to get, um, and, and, and he, read, he read for about, he read for about um, 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 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes, something like that, and he got to the pace at the end of this, at, at the end of about 30 minutes, he went to tear off a page, and, um, and he struggled and he struggled and he, and he pulled and he pulled. And my heart, honest to God, my heart, I, I, was, I, I didn't want him to die on my watch. Um, I, I, was the, I, was, I was the writer there at the, at the time. I was part of the group that invited him and, and all of that. And, and I, of course, I realized what was happening. He had more than one page. The reason he was, he was having trouble tearing it off was that he had more than one page. And in fact, when he finally when he finally did manage to rip it from the manuscript, it went out into the audience, and of course, it was three pages, and they all went in different directions. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, because now he's looking at, he's now he's looking at a manuscript, he's now three pages beyond. <laughs> and you could see him just stare at it and try to, try to make sense of it. And then he did the most incredible thing. He, he, he said, okay, um, I thought perhaps this might happen. And he set the manuscript down, and out of his coat, he took another manuscript. <laughs> smoothed, smoothed the pages down and, and began again. It was a much shorter, <laughs> it was a much, it was a much shorter story. And there was a point, because he was a kind of a postmodern writer, and, and the themes were not dissimilar. And so when he got about halfway through the second story, I thought, oh, my God, this old fox has fooled us. It's the same story. He, st he staged the whole thing, and we're going to get the ending. It's going to be like a Garrison Keillor story. You're going to get the ending to the thing that you'd forgotten about, and, and it was all going to dovetail. That's too good to be true. I wish that were, that were the case. Um, but it's one of the great moments of my, my um, uh, of, of my career as a, as, a, as a writer and a teacher to remember that, that great man doing that incredible work uh, and to have such incredible just um, courage and dignity to stand in front of an, an, a huge auditorium knowing that, that you know, um, he was not the man he was 20 years earlier and to just perform, my God. Thank you all so much for coming today. I just want to, you got them all applauding. I want to make sure they know. So there are books out in the lobby and
Rick will be signing from his newest book, but I think there are also others mm -hmm. there. I'll be joining him with my books. But thank you so much to all of you and to Rick for being here. Thank you again.